Hey everyone. So before I get my interview with Dr. Pierce, I just want to let you know about our new gut brain health community called Wired for Healing. This is specifically designed for people with conditions like mast cell activation syndrome. We employ brain retraining, limbic system training, lifestyle and dietary interventions to help people overcome longstanding chronic illness and trauma. We do five live classes a week and we have a really good supportive community that I'm really proud of. So I'm really hoping you guys could check it out. I'm going to link the website down in the description below and our code where you could get 10% off for the month. Thanks so much, guys. Hey everyone, so I have Dr. Tina Piers on with me today, and I've really dived into a lot of her talks on YouTube regarding mast cell activation syndrome, and she also is a specialist for long-haul COVID. So we're going to get into these topics today. Uh, Dr. Piers, thank you so much for coming on. I was hoping you could just start by introducing yourself and giving a bit of a background. Thank you, Scott. Um, so yes, I qualified a long time ago, 1983, um, and I did general practice initially um, and then became a women's health specialist quite quickly after that. Um, and I've concentrated on women's health predominantly. But in 2016, my youngest daughter, who had been ill all her life, and I'm sure a lot of you will relate to this, we couldn't quite put on our, our finger on what was the problem. Um, and, um, and she um, became super ill in 2016, because she uh, was fed up of feeling chronically ill. And so she was on a sort of real health kick. Um, and she was blitzing superfoods and drinking them. And of course, they were all high, really high histamine foods. So she was poisoning herself effectively. <laughs> And she just got iller and iller and iller over a four week period um, until such a point where she rang me up. She wasn't living at home then. She was a student nurse um, and she rang me up and in tears, which wasn't like her at all, and said, I, um, I am so unwell. I don't know what's happening to me. Um, my eyes are so swollen and I can hardly open them. My, my mouth is so sore and uh, ulcerated. I can't even drink any water. Um, and my body is bloated like a like a balloon. Uh, my eczema is so bad. If I move my head to one side, my you know skin just splits. Um, I feel terrible. I've got a migraine. Blah blah blah. So I rushed over to pick her up and brought her home, and that's where our MCAS journey started really because. We had to, I had to make a diagnosis and work out what was going on with her. She had dermatographism all over her face. Um, so we could have written our name on her forehead, you know, and it would have stayed there for 20 minutes. And um, and it actually was my husband who made the diagnosis really, because he, um, I, I said to her, look, you, we gave her a straw to drink some water through. And I said, I'm going to make you something to eat. And I had some organic carrots and organic potato, and I had some organic minced lamb. And I cooked it up for her and she sat there and we were sort of trying not to look like we were panicking, but we were panicking <laughs> because she looked so unwell. And uh, and she um, she had some carrot and she seemed that seemed to be all right. She had a bit of potato that seemed to be all right. And as soon as she put the mince lamb in her mouth, she just flushed even redder and like we'd set her on fire. And my husband said, it's like histamine. It's like she's just got too much histamine um in her face now and you've given her something she's allergic to and it was when he said histamine that something just uh, th sort of hit some nerve in my head where I thought I heard about histamine intolerance nine years ago and when I had looked about histamine intolerance nine years prior to that so in in 2007 there was nothing very much about it at all on the internet but I just sort of stored it away in the back of my mind. And then when he said that, of course, I re I looked again and there was a bit more information, thank goodness. And in 2016, there wasn't a massive information, but there was a little bit more, enough for me to feel confident, reasonably confident in making the diagnosis in her that she had histamine intolerance. And uh, when we took a history of all the symptoms she had, which were like 30 different symptoms, um, it all fitted with the hyperinflammation caused by high histamine levels. And then, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners will really relate to this. We then had to try and find somebody to help us. And that was the challenge <laughs> because we couldn't find any doctors anywhere who seemed to know anything about it. Um, most of them hadn't even heard of it. And um, and that was really very scary and frustrating um, because whilst I'd made the diagnosis, I, I'm not supposed to treat my own family um, and certainly things could be bought over the counter. So it wasn't a question of making any prescriptions, but, um, you know, 
I wanted to make sure that I could speak to somebody who was who knew about it and was experienced and had helped people with the condition so that we could then help my daughter. And we went to six different consultants and doctors and um, two professors and nobody knew anything. And it was so dispiriting and I was getting so worried. And then finally, um, I spoke to one of my colleagues. I was working at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London at that point. And um, I spoke to one of my colleagues and he said, how's your daughter? And I said, oh, she's really not good at all. Um, she's got a histamine issue. I'm sure it's her mast cells. And with that, he said, ah, oh, mast cells. I have a friend who's really interested in mast cells. He's a urogynecologist. And I was like, oh, Okay. And he said, I'm going to ring him up. Let's speak to him. So we spoke to this Professor Vic Kular, who's in London. And um, Professor Vic Kular treats a lot of women with interstitial cystitis. And because of that, he had realized that all these women who were coming to him with interstitial cystitis also had IBS, hypermobility, uh, various other things, chronic headaches, some of them, and rashes and eczema, and et cetera, et cetera. A very sort of typical MCAS kind of history. And he realized that it was all connected. Um, and so speaking to him was just amazing. Um, I reeled off all of her symptoms and I said, I really think she's got histamine intolerance. And he said, you're absolutely right. And I can't tell you the relief was enormous that um, we got an answer and that I'd found somebody who knew what they were talking about. So he guided us and helped us to get her better. Um, and um, and that developed my interest in MCAS. So that was a very long way of telling you <laughs> that um, that's how I became really interested in it. And once you know something, you can't unknow it really, can you? And then you just see it everywhere. <laughs> so um, I was at that time a consultant in contraception and I was seeing women and girls in my clinics. And um, when I was taking a history to work out which which um, uh, and contraception would be the right one for them and which what their options were, they would tell me about IBS, et cetera, et cetera. And I would go, oh, I think I might know what's wrong with you. And they would burst into tears because they would be so relieved that somebody was, first of all, taking an interest and secondly, knew what might be causing all their issues. And yet they've been to many, many doctors, sometimes over decades with no relief whatsoever and no support. Um, so that's, and I suppose I started diagnosing maybe five or six people a week um, and helping them. And they come back and say, I feel so much better. This is so good, you know, and, they, and pick up their contraceptive pill at the same time. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then, uh, so it went from there really. And then in 2000, well, in 2020, when there was the, um, all the, everything that's been going on since 2020 in the world, um, I realized quite early on how to treat uh, the acute infection that was hitting the world. Um, and um, because I could see patterns very similar to the MCAS, really, uh, patients. And therefore, I thought, well, the same treatments would work. And they did. So when I, I started treating people with acute infections um, and they got better within 24, 36, 48 hours. So um, and then in the August, sorry, I'm doing a lot of talking and you're not saying anything, Scott, because I'm not giving you a chance. I'm sorry. Um, and then in the August of 2020, I started hearing about long COVID patients and um, and I thought they sound like my MCAS patients, um, post viral fatigue, ME type patients. And so I really ought to speak to some of them and see if I can help them, too. And that's when I opened a long COVID clinic. Um, and lo and behold, um, many it was fully booked within 36 hours for more than six months. And um, and then it was very interesting. The journey has been very interesting, helping pa patients with this post viral long COVID uh, sort of um, syndrome, really. Um, and then more recently, people who have been reacting very badly to the injections that they've been getting. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Wow. OK. <clears throat> There's a lot to break down there. Um, so I want to get to sort of, I guess we could begin with the causes and, and sort of root causes. Now, mm -hmm. everything you just said sp speaks to me because I've been dealing with chronic pelvic pain syndrome, you know, which I guess you could, you know, you could lump in interstitial cystitis. I mean, gut mm -hmm. issues, what they call irritable bowel or SIBO or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's something I've dealt with for God knows how long now. 
Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I have mast cell activation syndrome. So my sort of understanding of it is sort of like the root cause is some level of gut dysbiosis, uh, leaky gut. Uh, what, what in your estimation are the root causes of mast cell activation? I, when I'm taking a history from somebody, I ask them about their childhood, you know, what, what it, did you get lots of infections when you were little? Did you have eczema or asthma or psoriasis? Or did you have um, any um, uh, sen sensitivities to food in particular or um, uh, IBS type symptoms? And then also, did you were you ever exposed to mold? Because mold and mycotoxins, I'm sure, um, as you're aware, are particularly toxic and will really give uh, something called CIRS, which is chronic inflammatory response syndrome which is very very um it's akin to mcas um so mold exposure is super important and sorting out the mycotoxins is very very important because they stay in your body for you know forever unless you do something constructive to get rid of them um and uh, and then i also ask about you know epstein bar virus so glandular fever lyme's disease all these chronic kind of um uh, afflictions that they could have had um, and also if they've had any childhood trauma, uh, trauma is a big one. It will up dial. You know, if you have a, a little child and they feel unsafe all the time, then their immune system is going to try and protect them and is going to up dial to become more and more sensitive, uh, to try and keep that child safe. And, um, so emotional trauma in childhood or teenage years, or even later in life, has a very important role to play in making people's mast cells more and more sensitive. And, um, and so we, we look for all of those things because one of the principles of treatment is to get rid of the triggers and you have to avoid the triggers as much as possible. Um, so that is high histamine foods, that is stress, um, that is um, sorting out the mycotoxins, sorting out and supporting the body with uh, glandular fever and um, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and treating somebody with say EMDR for emotional stress in the past so they can deal with it and, and move it to a different part of their brain so it's not quite so toxic for them. Um, and there are other things that they can do, like the Gupta program and other neuroplastic retraining kind of programs where you can dial down. You can actually consciously speak to your subconscious and dial down the, um, the, the immune system. So those are some basic principles, really, and causes. Um, so it's genetic, I think. But then there are epigenetic influences that make those genes more uh obvious those problems more obvious yeah Do you think that there could be some component because i think that what we don't really know in the research yet is what kind of what is genetics and what is bacteria that's passed down from our parents mm -hmm. so inheriting that gut mi microbiome that could be damaged yeah absolutely and i think there's a lot of gray area there like we don't really know what's genetics and what's just bacteria that's passed down yeah is that something that you you've uh looked into and and do you have a hard time to sort of deciphering between the two i do i do i think generally though most of the patients i mean we all know that for everybody whether they've got mcas or not the microbiome is super important and you know it's the it's the, the seat of our immune system and it helps our brain and it helps our emotions etc cetera, etc cetera. and so the the microbiome is critical and what i find in my patients with mcas is so often they have dysbiosis they have an imbalance where that's come from it's difficult to know it's difficult to know whether that's because they had lots of antibiotics when they were children because they had loads of tonsillitis you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very tricky to know where it's come from. But we do know that once people, if they've, we have a lot of mast cells in our gut, um, the mast cells are basically like, um, they're like bouncers in a club and they stand just inside the door <laughs> and they want to stop anything, anyone coming in who shouldn't be there. So they are lining the gut wall. They are lining your sinuses and your airways. They're, you know, lining the lungs. They are under your skin, which is why we see so many. Uh, and they also, the mast cells also line the nerves, actually. They're on uh, either side of the neurons. So when they are activated, 
um, and they release the cytokine storm and all these chemicals, they're going to affect the nerves, they're going to affect the skin, they're going to affect the gut. And in the gut, they cause inflammation. So this high histamine release and all the other cytokines that come with them cause inflammation. And when, and as you know, if you've got inflamed gut cells, then that causes leaky gut because it's a little bit like instead of having a beautiful brick wall that's all the bricks are um, really uh, close to each other and there's no gaps, so there's nowhere for the wind to get through, it, they become like there's no mortar between the, the bricks and they're all funny shapes and, and so things can get through that shouldn't. Um, and so semi-digested food gets in and then the body thinks that's a foreign invader and then you get your immune response. So that causes more, more histamine to be released, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes a vicious cycle. And actually calming the gut, looking after the gut is so key in all of this. Um, I'd like to get into treatments a little bit more. I know you touched base very quickly on some of them earlier, mm. but uh, I'd like to sort of separate them a little bit, like maybe get into diet as its own subject, because mm -hmm. obviously that plays such a huge role in managing MCAS and, and perhaps um, fixing it. Um, I don't know if there's a, if you think there's a cure to this or not, but um, so what sort of diets like as a practitioner would you recommend to somebody, somebody had comes to you, they're reacting to every food imaginable, they're down to five foods like myself, I'm one of them. Um, and they're just like, I can't eat anything. What, where do I go from here? Okay. So, um, so there's a very good website, um, called what the bleep can I eat.com. And I've asked people to have a look at that. And I asked them to go on a low histamine diet. So that's the no histamine content foods and low histamine content foods, which comes to about 200 foods, just under 200. And that is really the, our basis. Now, uh, you're absolutely right. I've got some patients who can only have two or three different foods sort, you know, types, and they are really struggling. And um, and I must say, in my experience, I have managed to get them out from that place to being able to eat much more, um, if not to be able to eat uh, everything, at least certainly all the low and the no histamine foods. So that's a huge improvement. Um, and um, so that's where we start. And I think it, it's very important to um, to actually know what the patient is eating, because sometimes people think they're on a low histamine diet and they're not. And they're just tripping themselves up um, with one thing that they thought was low histamine. And actually, it's really high. So um, I've got patients who you know, say, oh, yes, yes, I, I don't have any I don't have any gluten and I don't do this. And I don't do that. But, you know, I have almond milk every day and. And he's like, oh, please don't do that. <laughs> you know, the almond milk is not great. Or I have I only have three coffees a day. Don't worry, I only have three coffees. And it's like, well, actually, that's not gonna, that's not gonna do you any good. So they're sort of, you know, um, sabotaging their own progress, really. So I think it's important to be as clean as possible with your diet. No alcohol, no tea, no coffee, no green tea. A lot of people, you know, they stop the tea and coffee and go to green tea, which is really high in histamine. Um, no chocolate, um, I'm afraid, which is the hardest one uh, for many people. Um, you can have white chocolate, but not, not ordinary brown chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate is no good. Um, and, uh, and also no processed foods, have organic as much as possible. Um, have um, things as fresh as possible and no leftovers. So people have to re-educate themselves quite dramatically in some cases. Um, and, um, and people won't necessarily see an improvement immediately. So you have to be very patient with in this game, um, as I'm sure you found out. <laughs> Uh, I also have had patients who become very, very electromagnetic, you know, the EMFs really affect them, electromagnetic frequencies. So they can't hold their phone. They can't sit in front of their computer. Um, they're very, very sensitive to all of that. Um, uh, but with time, calming the mast cells down, calming the immune system down, they find that they become less and less reactive uh, to perfumes and chemicals and, and so on. So, yeah, we have to... Um, certainly address the diet. And then the diet isn't going to improve, um, uh, as you say, we, we in, until we start doing some other treatments as well. So, um, so that would be type one antihistamines. And it's important to try each one in turn for a week or two weeks and to decide whether it's helping or not. And if it's not helping, try a different one. 
Um, and if it's helping and it's brilliant to stick with it, but take sufficient of it, you know, one has to take enough. So um, if somebody is bad, like my daughter was, or is, is feeling very unwell or having a flare, lots of symptoms, I would say take one loratadine, 10 milligrams, three or four times a day, or sat- and then try cetirizine um, three or four times a day, 10 milligrams, or fexofenadine, 180 milligrams, four times a day is the maximum safe dose. And just work very methodically through the different ones to see which is the best one for you. Um, people sometimes use Benadryl, sometimes they use, uh, there's another one, it's name's escaping me at the minute, that's particularly good for bladders actually, chlor, 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 what is it, chlorate, um, can't remember, anyway, sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> it's gone out of my head. But there is one that's specifically good for bladders, um, which I will I will find out for you, Scott, and I'll send it to you by email. Sure. Yeah, I'll link it in the uh, description. Yes, and then you can let everyone know. But um, yeah, so we do type one antihistamines, then type two antihistamines. We try now um, for motadine or um, or nizatidine twice a day. Um, especially if they have a lot of IBS type symptoms, diarrhea, constipation, uh, acid reflux. And I mean, I, I've had some people dramatically improved by giving them formotidine twice a day. Um, I had one, I have one lovely lady who um, is a nurse and she was so ill with her, with her histamine issues and her muscle activation. She had, she had such severe POTS that if she, in the morning when she woke up, she couldn't get up and go to the toilet. She had to crawl along the floor to get to the bathroom and then very, very gradually try and sit on the toilet because if she just stood up and went, she would faint. Her blood pressure was so low and then she would have an epileptic fit. Um, So the poor girl was constantly hitting her head and damaging herself from, from falling over and having epilepsy. Uh, as it's sort of brought on by the hypoxia and she she would she was working as a nurse and um she if she stood too long at the drug trolley give, sorting sorting out somebody's drugs she would she would faint and then fit in the on the ward i mean this was happening to her almost on a daily basis she also had diarrhea eight or nine times a day and this had been the case for decades I mean, horrendous. So you imagine any journey, you need to know where all the toilet stops are on the way if you're going to have a diarrhea, urgent diarrhea eight or nine times a day. Well, anyway, and when when she had her first consultation, it was on her mobile phone and she was actually in hospital and I was giving her a consultation on the phone while she lay in her hospital bed because she'd had an epileptic fit and they'd admitted her to hospital. Um, the poor thing. Anyway, so I gave her formotidine, a uh, type one antihistamine, and then the formotidine, the type two. And she promises me that this is no joke. She, after the first dose of formotidine, her diarrhea stopped. She couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it. And uh, I mean, just such an amazing transformation so quickly and so easily. And then um, and then we put her on a mast cell stabilizer as well, which is the next thing that we put people on. So that would be something like ketotifen or pisotifen or rupatidine. Uh, These are mast cell stabilizers. Um, Quercetin is a natural one that you can buy over the counter very easily without a prescription. And um, we put her on that and she's ended up being on 15 milligrams twice a day, which is a really high dose, but that has transformed her, her life. She doesn't have the pot so severely. She doesn't faint. She doesn't have epileptic fits. She's not injuring herself and she's able to have a much more normal life. Um, so we do that. And then the, uh, so that's type one antihistamines, type two antihistamines, um, a mast cell stabilizer, which sodium chromoglycate is, that's a mast cell stabilizer. So when somebody has a lot of gut issues, and often if they have tenderness in the epigastrium, so just underneath the rib cage, across the abdomen there, if you're tender there, that usually indicates mast cells are um, have, have formed in the wall of the transverse colon. And therefore, sodium chromoglycate, which is a mast cell stabilizer, could be very, very useful. Um, and certainly my Jesse found it very, very useful. She did a three-month course and it transformed uh, a lot of her symptoms for her. 
Um, usually you start with a low dose, like 100 milligrams mid between meals. So we start people slowly. So 100 milligrams mid morning for, for a week and then do 100 milligrams mid morning and one mid afternoon for a week and then add in one before you go to bed for another week. So you're doing three a day and then gradually increase it to 200 milligrams until, until you're on 200 milligrams three times a day. Um, and it's probably quite sensible to be fairly slow with it. Um, and usually that calms down the mast cells and settles down the epigastric tenderness and, and bloating and, um, and pain. Um, sometimes people find they just have to do the three months once. Um, and sometimes they have to do it repeatedly, maybe once a year or, you know, just when they feel that things are building up again. Uh, then we also use low dose naltrexone. I'm sure you're all very familiar with that. That's an amazing, amazing drug. Um, there's an excellent website. It's called ldnresearchtrust.org. I would highly recommend everyone has a look at that. It explains what LDN is, how it works, and it's a great long list of conditions that it's helpful in. Um, and there's also a patient information leaflet and a doctor's information leaflet on there, which has got some good information for people. Um, so we use LDN. And then the other thing I use is this. This, can you see? Yeah, arc, arc. Okay, what is that? Okay, it's amazing. So basically, it gives you a microcurrent. It's a microcurrent device. Um, on the back of the this this strap, this strap goes round your arm, upper arm, or your ankle, and it's got it's got you know pads on the back, two little pads on the back. I just lick my finger, make them slightly wet, and then put it round my ankle. And it's got four, um, it's got four different, I'll switch it, switch it on you, as you can see. Hang on. Here we go. Okay, so that tells me that the battery's fully, and then it's on, it's on program two at the moment. And then, yeah, so then it wants me to just put it on or off. I'll just switch take it off for a minute. So this gives you a microcurrent which boosts the ATP production in all of your cells in your whole body. So this is really super important for both MCAS patients, long COVID patients, and patients post-injection, because the, um, the spike is particularly toxic to the mitochondria, which make ATP and store ATP. Hmm. So very, very useful little device. I, I, wear, I encourage my patients to wear it as much as possible. So at least for one three hour session in 24 hours, um, but more if possible. And the more you wear it, the more it works for you, the less inflamed you become and the more stable. It is incredible. It's an incredible device. It's called arcmicrotech.com is the website, arcmicrotech.com forward slash and then arc, the number four health, arc for health. And um, they are truly amazing. We've had men tell us who've had prostate cancer that their prostate cancer is gone when they use this machine. Um, I, there's a, a, a case I know of a little girl who had keloid scarring on her arm uh, from a, a scald when she was two. And when she was nine, her mother said, you know, could we use it and try? And they said, yeah, go for it. And um, she completely healed up. Her keloid scars completely resolved. Her body healed itself. So this little device enables the body to just heal itself and be the best it can be. And it reduces inflammation and promotes healing. And, it, and, not, and so that's one and two programs, one and two program three re, uh, promotes repair. So if you have an injury and you use program three, then you will heal more quickly uh, from that injury. So um, now my father is 90 and um, he lives in Spain and we, he, we, we brought him, we were going to bring him to England to, for his hip replacement. Um, and um, he unfortunately went into severe heart failure four weeks before he was due to come out uh so when he i bought one of these for him and as soon as he arrived i popped it around his ankle and took him to see a cardiologist who gave him diuretics etc to get rid of all the fluid he had an echocardiogram which showed that his left ventricular function was only 32 percent four months later his echocardiogram showed that his um his left ventricular function was 55 percent 
which was amazing. Now, he was on drugs. He was on diuretics, but predominantly diuretics. We didn't expect them to improve his heart function per se. And that was, you know, the cardiologists were very impressed. It was like, wow, that's amazing. And then when they went for operation, they said, we expect you uh, have a, we, you know, you have a 30% chance of dying in this operation because of your age and your heart. Um, and you might be in ITU for four or five days. Well, he flew through the operation. He absolutely th- flew through it. Um, and he was in ITU for less than 24 hours. He healed like a baby. There was no redness or swelling or anything of his scars. Um, and within a week, he was doing stairs. Uh, and then when we checked his PSA, he doesn't mind me telling you this, uh, when we checked his PSA, which is a measure uh, to indicate uh, how unhappy or happy the prostate is, um, he had an elevated one of like 7.9, 7.5, that kind of level for 15 years. And the urologist couldn't believe it. His PSA came back at 3.1. So it was completely wow. normal, completely normal. So um, lots and lots of stories coming out. People, infertility, couples with infertility get pregnant uh, using this, et cetera, et cetera. So really great device, working with nature helping your body heal itself. And uh, so I really would recommend that to people. Um, What else do we do? Um, For MCAS? You talked about limbic training a little bit. Um, And we we actually have our own community called Wired for Healing, which is a limbic training community. Um, Can you touch a little bit on that and how that plays a role? I know you talked a little bit about childhood trauma. Uh, yeah. what about, you know, adults, you know, we have a lot of people in our group who have like gone through severe sort of trauma as adults, you know, losing a loved one or, or something. Um, yeah. how much of a role does that play in, in, in addressing that to heal this yeah. condition? We think, I think a lot of my patients say that they feel it contributes 30% to their improvement, which is really quite dramatic. Um, and um, and when you think about it, the um, if you are in a fight or flight kind of situation where things are scary or upsetting, you're frightened or hurt, then your immune, your conscious mind, your your conscious mind will talk to your unconscious mind and say, "This is scary. This is bad. Protect me. Keep me safe." And the unconscious mind will go, "Okay, what I can do is ramp up the immune system," <laughs> uh, and it's the retraining is learning how to um, actually um, tone that down and tell the immune system and the unconscious mind, the subconscious mind, I'm safe, I'm safe, it's okay, everything's going to be fine. And it really does work. And they, you know, it's a combination, I don't know what you you do, I'm sure it's very similar, meditation, positive uh, affirmations, actually using physical doing physical steps and things as well, not just thinking about it, but actually standing up and turning around and walking away from what you imagine to be the ill the ill health and the symptoms and walking towards a good future where you imagine yourself being very healthy and happy and, and seeing that. Um, and this is very powerful. It's very, very powerful. You can definitely downgrade the reactions. Um, and uh, I think it's, yeah, it's, we've had some very good results with it. And it, there are lots out there and it's great you're doing one. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to throw you a real curveball because, you know, my channel is really geared towards people who have been living with sort of chronic debilitating illness for quite some time uh, and myself included in that. You know, what if somebody comes to you, um, they've tried everything, they've tried all these medications. Um, and, and I have talked to, you know, a number of people that have tried the sort of gamut of medications, like, you know, the antacids are sort of counterintuitive, counterintuitive to them because they have like low stomach acid. Um, chromalin seems to rev them up something fierce, like, uh, you know, um, and, and I guess sort of regular antihistamines don't seem to work for them. I mean, where, where can they go from there? What else? Okay. There are lots of things we can do working with nature. And, um, and the, um, I'm, this is new to me. This is start, something I've been very interested in, um, in the last few years, and I'm only starting now to learn more and more about it. But I think that, um, I think that, um, we need to do things like grounding, 
um, I don't know what you call it, a uh, thing, grounding. Yeah, I um, think it's sort of, yeah, go hand in yeah, hand, or think yeah. same type of thing, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So as often as you can. I mean, certainly we know that the light from the sun is, is super important that it gets to hit the back of your retina. And I encourage patients to, when they wake up first thing in the morning, to go and open their front door and just look out at the brightest part of the sky. Even if they can do it for 20 minutes with their, you know, drink of water in their hand or a herbal tea or whatever they're having, um, then all, all good. If you can just do it for five minutes or two minutes, do it. Do it. It's better than not doing it at all. And that sends very important messages to your brain and starts you making melatonin. And melatonin is very protective of cancer. It's also very important that you start making the right melatonin uh, in the quantities so that actually by the time you go to bed, it's it's your circadian rhythm is being established basically. So try and during the day go out and just look at the sky as well. So lunchtime, mid-afternoon, and then as the as the sky is getting a bit darker as well, because these are giving very important messages to your brain. And the other thing is to have um, uh, not to have too much blue light um, beyond the hours of uh, light, you know, sunshine. So when it starts to get dark in the sky, you want to you want to have a, a filter um, on your phone and your um, computer and so on. And there are companies that do that. Sometimes people wear glasses, don't they? Uh, that filter out the blue light um, because that can un- upset your circadian rhythm. So doing simple things like that can really be helpful. Um, then also the water we drink is terribly important. And I'm learning more and more about this. I'm not an expert at all, but I'm starting to learn about structured water and how interesting that is for people um, and how it boosts ATP production. Again, helping the mitochondria, giving you more energy, giving the cells more energy. So, um, yeah, structured water. Very interesting. There's there's so much we don't know yet. (laughs) Um, And uh, and I'm desperate to, to learn about the quantum medicine that is now becoming more and more, you know, known about, which is fantastic. Um, And um, yes, on that note, um, so yeah, so sorry, there are other things that you can do as well, actually, because I'm talking about the really severely ill people. Um, And sometimes it's things like using other machines like the ARC machine, um, or using um, the, there's one called a Rife machine. Have you come across that? No, I've never heard of that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are some other machines that look, look at vibrational energy uh, and they measure the vibrational energy of the body and they can detect whether you've got an infection, a parasite that needs sorting out. Um, you know, there will be something that's triggering these people that hasn't been removed, that some trigger that hasn't been removed, whether it's mycotoxins or whatever. So one has to just be very a bit like Sherlock Holmes, really, and try and find it. Um, and then calm their systems down. Some people find hypnotherapy very helpful um, in conjunction with the, you know, the neuroplastic retraining kind of program. Um, There are various other machines. There's another one um, uh, called Maxima, I think it is. And that again, helps the lymphatic drainage in the body. Um, So yeah, all the things that one can do to try and um, improve the balance really in the body and i think that i think the structured water has actually got a very important role to play yeah so dr Piers, where can we find you are you doing consultations with people still or are you too busy these days or or uh how can people possibly book in with you if they want uh, some treatment so, um, that, so i can only see people um people in my clinic my doctors in my clinic can only see people if they're resident in the uk unfortunately hmm. but you're very welcome to look at my website because there's a lot of information i've got two websites one is called drtinapiers.com and the other one is called menopauseconsultancy.co.uk and in fact they've got the same information on both um a lot about a lot of information um about histamine muscle activation etc that's great okay well i'll link your websites down below uh dr Piers, i just want to thank you so much for coming on 